So there are secrets to fishing, and uh, there are secrets to fishing in the spiritual realm as well. So let's read beginning with verse 1, chapter 21, and we're going to read down through verse 14. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. Now, whenever you read about a sea in the Bible, it's really the same as the Sea of Galilee. Earl, you've been there a lot more times than me. There's only one sea there. That's the Sea of Galilee. Well, we know we got the, the Dead Sea, but there's only the one lake. It's really more like a lake. And it's the Sea of Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee. It's all the same place. Am I not correct in assuming that? So they're there at the Sea of Galilee, and he showed himself. Verse 2, Simon Peter Thomas called the twin, Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two of the, his disciples were together. And Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, we are going with you also. And they went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast the net, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, anybody know who that is? Mm -hmm. said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciple came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with the fish. Then, as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread, and Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. And Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to the land full of large fish, 153. Although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. And this is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. May God add his blessing to the reading of his most holy word, and all the saints of God said, Amen and Amen. Now I want you to just notice some things here that uh, I've addressed in the past, but I want to make known to you again and these are all points that I believe let us know that John actually wrote this gospel after he wrote the book of Revelation or the, the, the letter of Revelation, whatever you want to call it. And here's some of the ways we know that. The phrase, after these things, occurs in the book of John. And that Greek word, metatata, is also the same phrase that is used in the book of Revelation. Now, when you read in the book of Revelation, a lot of times you'll find that that there's a direct revelation that was given to him. So John is borrowing from his experience in the spirit that he had on the book of Revelation. He also uh, used a heptatic, which heptatic means uh, a seven, a structure of seven throughout the book of John, similar to what he experienced in the book of Revelation. When you read the book of Revelation, you read there were seven trumpets, you read there were seven angels, you read there were seven bowls. How many of you know about those things, right? And then when you read the book of John, he doesn't tell about all the miracles. He talks about seven miracles, and he talks about the seven I am statements of Jesus Christ. And so we find that that was kind of a, a replication of the book of Revelation as well. And then here we read that he used the word he showed himself there in verse 1. And the word showed there means manifested. It means more than to just to see. It means literally to comprehend, to understand, to have insight into something. And we know that this is same, uh, that was the same word that's used in Revelation 4 and 1 where he said to John, come up here and I will show you the things which must happen after this. So we kind of put uh, 
we look at John's gospel and we find that the stories and the details that John leaves out are not uh, equal to what we call the synoptic gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're kind of very similar in their writings. They tell some of the same stories. But John's gospel is different because he knows that people already have uh, reference to those three gospels. Therefore, he wrote his gospel with a different thing in mind, and that was a different purpose in mind, and that was he wanted people to know the Christ that he had seen in the revelation, the, the coming King of kings and the Lord of lords, he wanted them to know that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, that they might believe on him. And that is the purpose that John wrote his gospel the way he did. And I just, uh, just want to make that point to you that it was probably written after he wrote the book of Revelation. I just find that interesting. Then notice that it said that, that Peter said that I am going fishing. Now, there are seven disciples that are here in this story that are listed there. It gives the names of five of them. But I, did you notice that two of them were unnamed? Two of them, we don't know who they were. And let me say that the majority of disciples today are unnamed. Amen? The vast majority of people that are doing the work of the ministry don't have a title. And I want to say to you what Pastor Ron said last week. He said only 3% of people that are in ministry are actually in full-time ministry, those that are being paid. So that means that 97% of people, how many of you know we are all in the ministry? Amen? Every day, every hour, you are in ministry. If you didn't know that, I ordain you right now in the name of Jesus. I release you to your ministry right now in the name of Jesus. I bless you right now in the name of Jesus to answer the call because we are all in the ministry of winning souls for Jesus Christ. And the reason that 4,000 churches a year are closing their doors in America is because many people have the wrong mindset. They think that we pay a pastor or we pay a staff to do the ministry. No, the purpose of a ministerial staff is to prepare the church, the congregation, to do the work of the ministry according to Ephesians chapter 4. Amen? So you are the ministers. We're just the preparers. And the only way that the church is going to thrive and grow is when the people of God understand that they have a calling and a purpose, and that is to reach souls for the cause of the kingdom of God. Amen? You are an unnamed army that is to reach the harvest and advance the kingdom of God in the Charleston Tri-County area. If you believe that, say amen and amen. And here in verse 3, Peter says, I'm going fishing. Now, a lot of times, ministers, and I have even myself kind of chastised Peter because he went back to fishing and kind of left his call as being a disciple. But we have to remember some things about uh, what was going on here. First of all, Peter was there in Galilee because Christ told them to go and wait for him there at Galilee. Secondly, it demonstrated that Peter was industrious. You know, they could have been sitting around, but hey, he had mouths to feed. Now, I, I'm the type of person, if I don't know what God's clearly said to me, now I know, I know what the rule is. The rule says don't do anything unless God's told you to do it. But I've found that sometimes I'll say, Lord, I don't know if you're telling me to do this, but I'm not just going to sit around and do nothing. And I've found that a lot of times if I'll go out and attempt to do something, God will bless me and open a door into something else. Now, I'm not the only one that did that. If you look at the Apostle Paul, there was a time in his ministry where he wasn't exactly sure where the Holy Spirit was sending him. He was on a boat headed somewhere, and the Holy Spirit stopped them, right? How many of you remember that story from going into Bithynia, I believe it was, and turned him around? So I believe it's better to do something than to do nothing at all. Unless God's told you to wait, and you know you're waiting on the Lord, Peter shows he's being industrious. He's got mouths to feed. The other thing I'll point out is that a lot of times when people get under stress, it's good for you to go back to something that you do well. Now, I'm not talking about hitting the bottle here, okay? <laughs> I'm talking about if you're good at playing tennis or if you're good at knitting or crocheting or some of these types of things, when you're under stress, we know it's therapeutic for you to go back to something that you're familiar with, something that makes you feel good, and that's what Peter was doing. 
you know, he, they didn't know what to do. They'd seen the resurrected Christ. They're kind of waiting. So Peter's going back to doing something that he knows and something that can make him feel good. But the, but the problem is, it didn't make them feel good because they didn't catch a single fish. But notice that the others said, Peter, hey, we're going with you. Peter, Peter was like people who take action in times of crisis. When you take action in the time of crisis, people view you as a leader. Now listen to me, church, we are living in a time of crisis right now. We're just getting over, and and we're not even certain we're over it, but we're just coming into a lull with the COVID crisis and the pandemic. We're living in a time when uh, Russia has invaded Ukraine, and Putin has bullied the world. He threatened the whole world, didn't he? He said, if anybody interferes, I've got my nuclear weapons ready. And there are people that are afraid of what might happen. Inflation is rising. Suicide rates are going up. More addictions to opioids. 50% more people are addicted to opioids this year than they were last year, and last year was an increase over the previous years. We are living in a time of crisis, and people are looking for someone that knows what to do, somebody that will take action. And you and I have the mind of Christ. We've been given an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. We don't have to wring our hands. We don't have to complain and worry about what's going on in the world. We know that the God that we serve is sovereign and that he is in control of all of the events that are happening in this world. uh, Paul wrote to Timothy, I know in whom I believed in and I am persuaded that he will keep that which I've committed unto him until that day. We can know that God will keep us until the day of the Lord's return and nothing is going to happen that will surprise him or take him off guard. Amen? So let us be the people that when people come to us, we might not be able to explain all this happening in the world, but we can have a calm. We can have an assurance. And we can have a a, a word to say to them, like like Brother Chad prayed this morning, the world might be falling apart, but I've got a sure thing in my life. I've got an anchor in my life, and my anchor holds uh, even in shifting times uh, and in difficult situations in the world. And that anchor is Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Lord. Hallelujah. If you believe it, somebody say amen to the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So they went out fishing, all seven of them. They fished all night, but they fished in the arm of their flesh, and they caught nothing. Now, how many of you know that's a bad fishing trip? When you send seven men out in two boats and fish all night, and you don't catch anything, that's a bad night fishing. Amen? But the Bible said when morning came, Jesus was standing at the shore. Amen? Hallelujah. Jesus was standing at the shore. Now, all of this is designed. I want you to understand this story is all designed. It's a divine setup. It was all set up to reveal Christ as the resurrected Savior, but also to restore Peter. And I want you to understand that whatever you might be going through in your personal life, it's all part of a divine setup. You might find yourself in the middle of a struggle. You might find yourself in the middle of a test. You might feel like you failed. You might feel like you're in the middle of the night. But I want to encourage you, don't lose hope. God will cause all things to work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. Amen? And some of you, you might have been through a dark night, but I want to declare that the morning sun is rising. Hallelujah. The dawn is breaking, and Jesus is standing at the shore. I want you to notice that Jesus was where the disciples were headed. I want you to know today, church, that Jesus knows where you're going, and he's gone ahead of you. He's already prepared the way. He's standing there to welcome you. Hallelujah. He knows what's going to happen to us before we do. 
and he's gone before us and he's standing there waiting and I want you to know he's not just sitting there doing nothing he's there cooking up a miracle he's there preparing a point of blessing for you hallelujah he is on the shore that you're destined to it's a place of blessing and this fish and this bread it reminds them of the supernatural catch that God did it reminds you I want you to know there's a miracle on the shore where you're headed God knows uh, where you're going uh, but not only was it a miracle but fish and bread was a staple it was their daily bread and Jesus said to pray give us this day our daily bread not just to have enough money to pay our bills uh, but to have the bread of heaven the manna of heaven God wants to speak to you God wants to feed you by his spirit today hallelujah and he's there at the shore beckoning you to come and dine the master is calling come and dine with him today he's got a table spread for us amen and he says to them he says children do you have any food now I don't know about you but I don't like it when people call me boy amen these are grown men and he says children actually the Greek word there padia means lads Have you any fish? Really what it means. And I want you to know Jesus wasn't cutting the disciples down. What it really means is this is a term of a teacher fisherman. This was an expression that would be what a teacher fisherman might say to somebody he's teaching how to fish. Lads, have you any fish? But I want you to notice that it required an honest assessment. They had to look in the boat. They had to look at their efforts, and they had to answer, no, I got nothing. If God's going to work in your life, if God is going to work a miracle in your life, before he can help you, you are going to have to make an honest assessment of yourself. Oh, come on now. You have to take an honest evaluation of yourself. That's what happened to Peter the first time they caught the miraculous catch of fish. And Peter fell down on his knees and made an honest assessment of himself. And he said, get away from me, Lord, because I am a sinful man. He recognized his true condition. He confessed it. The centurion said to Jesus, I'm not even worthy to have you come into my house. The woman at the well made an honest assessment when she said, I perceive that you are a prophet. And God wants us to stop hiding behind the facades of pride or stop hiding behind fear. Stop hiding behind shame. Somebody help me now. Come on. And just take an honest assessment and say, I don't want to live like this. Come before God, just be open and honest, and he will meet you with a miracle. He will transform your life. And so we find that Jesus is literally asking for nourishment. And this is the second time. You remember when he was in the upper room, he asked his disciples, do you have any food here? Now, why would the master who created everything, who obviously has the ability to catch fish or cause fish to appear, to put them on the fire, why do you think he would ask of the disciples for food? I think there's something, a message that he wants to relay to us here. If you go to John chapter 4, You remember Jesus told his disciples, he said, I have food that you don't even know about. Remember that? They had gone to Burger King. They had come back, and they were trying to get him to eat, but Jesus was in the middle of ministry, and they said, Lord, eat something. He said, I've got food that you don't even know about. And he said, that food is to do the will of my Father. And then if you read on down, it said the harvest is ripe. The harvest is plentiful. What Jesus was saying is what is it that nourishes him? What is it that feeds him is that when we enter into the ministry and bring souls into the kingdom, that's what feeds and nourishes our Lord and our Savior. Amen? So how do we feed him? How do we bless him? By the church having a hunger for souls, by us having an appetite for the lost. 
for us not being com- uh, satisfied and becoming complacent that the church is just a church and people are going to go to hell in a handbasket. We don't share our testimony. We don't have a compassion for the lost. No, what feeds the spirit of Jesus Christ is that when you and I have a burning desire to see souls won into the kingdom of God. Amen. Jesus had fish, but notice he wanted more fish. Come on, somebody. I I feel some conviction moving in the house. You're getting quiet on me. He had fish, but he wanted fresh fish. Amen? Everybody say amen. Amen. He had fish. He's got the church, but he wants the lost. He wants some fresh fish coming in through our doors. Now listen, how many of you are ready for a miraculous catch of fish? Well, guess what? They're not going to jump in the boat. Right? So you're going to have to go fishing. Now, when you think about going fishing, what I want you to think about is, where, are you, where is your fishing hole? You know, these people that fish a lot, you know, they got spots they like to go to. They know where the fish are. Where is your spot? Where are you called to? Ask God, is it where you work? Do you sense that God is opening doors? The other day I I was meeting with um, Diane and she said, the people at her work ask her to have a Bible study. Wow. The people at work are asking for a Bible study. Angela talked about how she prayed for somebody in her workplace, and the joy of the Lord came over and said it was just like the woman got exuberant in the doctor's office. Wow! Dale and Linda have a, started a prayer meeting in their neighborhood. They meet in a park and they pray, and people that don't even attend church are coming and asking for prayer requests. Wow! You need to ask God, where is your fishing hole? Where can you have influence for the kingdom of God? And then you need to ask God, what kind of bait should I use? I'm going to get your worm warm. <laughs> yeah, think about it. You need to ask God, should my bait be my testimony? Should my, my bait me, uh, be that I've memorized some verses of Scripture to share the gospel? Should the bait be that I tell them I, I want to pray for them right there on the spot when they begin to talk about some need they have? Is your bait going to be acts of service? Maybe you do kind deeds for them and that opens up a door for you to share. Ask God, what is your bait? What's your fishing hole? What's your bait? And then how are you going to reel them in? Are you going to invite them to supper? Have them at your house for supper? Or take supper to their house? Are you going to invite them to your small group? Are you going to invite them to church? How are you going to reel them in? You need to pray and ask God for a strategy to help you catch fish. In fact, let's just pause right now, and I want to ask everybody in the house, would you just take a moment and just begin to ask the Lord right now to help you have a strategy to win souls? Would you bow your heads right now? Father, I'm not at the conclusion of my sermon. Just pray with me. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm leading you, but you just pray with me. Father, I pray that you'll begin right now by the Spirit As these people are asking you, I pray that you'll show them the spot, show them the place, the people that you want them to minister to. God, I pray that you will put bait in their hand. Lord God, let them know. Give them verses of Scripture. Give them a testimony. Whatever it might be, Lord, give them the right bait. And God, I pray, as Brother Ron said, let them cross the chicken line. Let them cross over that fear. Let them cross over the lies that the devil is trying to tell them that nobody wants to hear that. Father, I pray, give them boldness, Lord, in this hour. And God, I pray that we'll begin to draw in the net. And Lord, we're believing for a miraculous catch of fish. Right now, as we are praying, just say, Lord, I'm asking you for a miraculous catch of fish. Asking for it right now. I'm asking you for a miraculous catch of fish in my life in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And amen. You know, my wife has discovered where her fishing hole is. It's her workplace. Now, it's not that that's the only place that she ministers, but that's where she believes the Lord's called her to work, uh, to fish at is where she works. 
And I, and I want to tell you this story because I want you to know that every time you throw the line out, you're not always going to get a, a yes. She had a, a, a man on his floor, and I've got to be careful not to violate HIPAA rules, but I'll just say that the man was so ill that they had called in hospice. Now, how many of you know when they call in hospice? Usually that means that life is terminal. So my wife, sensing that this man, man was at, near the end of his life, walked into the room and said, just kind of in light of your circumstances, could I pray with you? And if anybody knows my wife, she's a very compassionate person. She's a very loving person. It wasn't said in a condescending way. And the man said, no. He said, I don't believe in all that. He said, at one time I did believe in it. I used to go to such and such a church. But he said, I don't believe in that. How heartbreaking. Here's somebody that's getting ready to step into eternity. And God put a nurse in his path to ask him one more time, would you like to pray? And he turned down that opportunity. And I I want you to know, don't get discouraged if somebody gives you a no. Amen? You just keep knocking. Because I'm going to tell you, there is no greater thrill than when you're sitting there and all of a sudden that thing says, and you stand up, I got one, I got one. There is no greater thrill than you leading somebody into the kingdom of God. Somebody you prayed for, somebody you fasted for, somebody you've invited and and, and done all that you could do, and then that day that you see them accept Christ, I'm going to tell you that's the greatest joy there is this side of heaven is seeing somebody come to know the Lord. So I want to encourage you, go fishing. Go fishing this week. Ask the Lord, how can you go fishing? Now, they hadn't caught anything, and Jesus gives some instructions. He said, cast the net on the right side. Now, when I was studying this, uh, a lot of theologians say that it didn't make any difference if he told them to throw it on the right side or the left side, but I I beg to differ. How many of you know the right side, that's God's side? How many of you know that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father? If you're left-handed, God loves you. You ain't got nothing to be left-hand dominant or anything like that. But the right side is the side when he separates the sheep from the goats. How many of you know the sheep go on the right side, right? Acts 5 and 31, God exalted him to the right hand as prince and savior. That's God's side. That's God's way. So what he's saying is, I want you to do it. You fished all night your way. You've tried it on your own. Now do it my way. And they obeyed the voice of the Lord. They obeyed the voice and the leading of the voice of authority. And when they did, something miraculous happened. Now, they didn't even know it was Jesus at the time, remember? He was probably, that was probably about 100 yards away with the morning mist coming off the lake. They couldn't tell that that was Jesus. They didn't even know it was him until after the miraculous catch. But yet, they recognized the voice of authority and they were willing to obey. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Many times, the Lord's voice will speak to you through your own conscience. I'm, I'm going to confess to you, I've never heard the Lord speak to me, Stafford, I want you to do so and so. I've never heard the external, I don't doubt that people do, but I've never heard an external voice of the Lord. It's always came up through my spirit and many times through my conscience. And so a lot of times when you hear that prompting, God telling you to do something good, like to go maybe pray for somebody or maybe go give this person a piece of money or why don't you call so-and-so? You haven't seen them in a while. That's usually not just you because, trust me, you're not that good. It's the kindness of the Lord that leads us to repentance. And it's the kindness of the Spirit working in you. A lot of times, He will prompt you and bring people and things to your remembrance so that you can either then listen to that voice. See, they had a choice. They could have said, man, who's this guy on the shore? Who think he is? We've been fishing all night. We're professional fishermen. They could have just went and blew him off. But they recognized the leading of the voice of authority. And the more, hear me now, the more you listen to that voice and obey it, the more he'll speak to you. The more you listen and and led by the promptings of the Holy Spirit, the more he'll begin to speak to you. 
They'd fished all night and hadn't caught a single thing, but yet in one minute in obeying the Lord, the Lord accomplished more in just a few seconds than they could accomplish all night. This was a suddenly from God. And I want you to know, I believe we're about to move into a time of culmination. I believe we're about to move into a time when all of our failings, all of our striving, as well as all the good that we've done, our prayers, all of our intercession, all of our worship, I believe we're about to move into a time when God's going to drop some suddenlies in our path. I believe we're going to see the culmination of all these things, and we're going to see miracles, signs, and wonders happen in our place. And when God shows up, it was miraculous. The, the, the catch was so big that seven men could not even haul it into the boat. I'm saying to you, church, God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you can ask or think or imagine. It hasn't even entered into our hearts yet. He's given us visions and dreams of the church full of the Fire off full. You've got to believe for it. You've got to expect it. And I'm here to tell you, it's coming. Hallelujah. He's on the shore. He's given us direction. And we're casting the net on God's side. We're running this thing God's way. Hallelujah. And we're about to bring in a miraculous haul of fish. I believe it with all my heart. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Yes, Lord. And when that miracle happens, John remembers, hey, the last time this happened, that was Jesus. And so John gets the insight first, and he says to Peter, it's the Lord. Did you notice there was an explanation point behind that? He might have said, it's the Lord. Now, Peter was fishing in his fruit of the looms. He weren't naked. He would strip down to his loincloth. That's what they would do. And you know, I, you know, I don't mean to try to make a message out of everything, but I believe there's even a message in that. Sometimes we got to strip off the external, strip off our pride, strip off all the things that are weighing us down, strip off our love for the world, strip those things off, and then when we see Jesus, look what he does. He's, hey, he put the robe back on. Yeah, but look what he did. He baptized the robe. The robe got washed in the washing of the water of the, uh, of the word. Amen. He was approaching Jesus and the Lord cleansed him. Because see, it was shameful for you to appear before your Lord and your master unclothed. That's the only people that did that were slaves. But he was fishing there in his skivvies. But when he saw it was the Lord, he reminded him. Now, wait a minute. The last time we got a message about the Lord, when Mary told us that she saw the Lord and the tomb was empty, John beat me to the punch. I ain't going to let that young buck beat me this time. So instead of waiting for the boat to get to shore, he just dove right into the water and swam right up to Jesus. He wanted to be the first one there. Now, I told you at the start of this, I believe this whole thing, a big part of it was part of Jesus demonstrating himself as the Messiah, as the Lord, but the restoration of Peter. And there was something significant about the the fire and the coals and the fish there. And I'm going to save that for next week when I talk to you about Peter's restoration. But I want you to notice there's three miracles here. Three miracles here. First of all, the obvious one was the great catch of fish. But the second one was, did you notice that seven men couldn't haul the catch of fish into the boat, but it said that Peter went by himself and pulled the net up into the shore where Jesus was. Did you pick up on that? Huh? Seven men can't get it into the boat. Now, I know you can say, well, the boat was unstable and that, but you got seven men. Peter was there with them. They couldn't get it. But now, suddenly, one man, and they say that by guesstimating the size of the fish, the weight of the nets with water, that we were talking about in excess of over 300 pounds. One man goes and grabs 300 pounds and pulls it. And he's an older guy. Now, I believe this is something supernatural going on. I believe that the anointing of God hit him. I believe the power of God came over him. And one man was able to do what seven men could not do. And then did you notice that on this occasion, this time, the Bible said that the nets did not break. The first time when they had the great catch of fish, the, the nets began to break. But this time, the nets don't break. That's because they're under a different anointing. They're in a different time. 
It's not because they had better nets or new nets. They were probably using the same old nets they used before. Now, a lot of times people want to know, what does the 153 fish stand for? And I read all kind of stuff on this. Some of the early church fathers said that the 100 represented the Gentiles, the 50 represented the Jews, the 3 was the Trinity. Uh, One person said that the 153 represented all the different nations of the world. I don't really believe any of it. I believe that it was just a metric. God keeps good records of things. Amen? God keeps good records of things. He gave exactly how many fish was in there. He told how many souls were saved on the day of Pentecost. He tells, he, he is a good record keeper. Amen? I believe it was just a metric, but if there's anything that I saw in the 153 fish, the one thing that I saw would be this, that it might be a remez. It might be, and this is a rabbinical term for the word hint or clue. And sometimes we read in the Bible where God gives us little clues and hints about things that are yet to be fulfilled. It was kind of a prophetic clue, if you would. Now, what is that prophetic clue? How many of you have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? How many of you heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? You know the Dead Sea Scrolls, when they found them, they found them in very good condition, and they verified them. When I was in Israel, I actually got to read, look at it in one of those museums. You can actually read parts and portions of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they were preserved in these jars and found in these caves, and one of them called the Cave of Karam number 11. They actually numbered the caves as they began to find more of the, they called it not just the Dead Sea Scroll, but they called this one the Great Sea Scroll. In one of the containers, they found 153 psalms that were approved for worship in the tabernacle. Now, we've got 150 that are recorded in our Bible, but there were three additional psalms that had been approved for use and worship in the tabernacle. I believe this 153 fish might have been a little hint, a little winking of God's eye that in the future there was going to be a discovery of these Dead Sea Scrolls. I can't prove it, but I think it's more than circumstantial that it was the number 153 and there was exactly 153 psalms that were approved for worship in 1947 when they discovered these Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, I can tell you weren't too impressed with that, so we'll move on. Now, let's look at the miraculous catch a fish, and I want to compare for just a moment the first miracle of Jesus to the last miracle of Jesus. Before I tell you what it was, I just want to do a little test here. Who remembers what the first miracle of Jesus was in the book of John? Water into wine. Oh, good. I feel like I've done a good job maybe here. All right, so let's go back and let's look at the first, the place that the first miracle took place was in Galilee. Where was the last one? In Galilee. What was the time? In the first one, it was the third day of the feast. In the last one, it was now the third resurrection appearance of Jesus. The problem was, in the first one, they had no wine. In the last one, they had no fish. The instruction was, fill the water pots and cast the nets. Church, I want you to know that we have a part to play in fulfilling the great commission of Jesus Christ. See, we got a problem, and we kind of want God to just kind of show up and do everything. We just kind of have this expectation, well, if God wants it to happen, it'll happen. No, He almost always employs people in His plan for the world. Amen? And so, people had to follow these instructions. If they had not filled the water pots, the miracle might not have taken place. If they had not cast their nets they would not have had the miraculous catch of fish. You and I are instrumental in obeying the Lord and seeing God work through us. And then what was the results? The results was that the jars were filled to the brim with wine and they had a great catch of fish. I believe God wants to do miracles in our midst again today. Amen? Now, if you'll look at the lesser miracles, Peter's solo haul of the fish, I already mentioned that it was over 300 pounds. I don't believe Peter was just showing off. I believe there was something supernatural took place. And also, we know that the nets don't break, not because they're new, but because it's a new day. I believe that this is a prophetic act that is pointing to something that's about to happen just around the corner. 
Peter was, was endued with a supernatural power here. And on the day of Pentecost, he also, how many of you know, he was endued with a supernatural power called the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And when Peter cast his nets on the day of Pentecost, how many of you know he brought in a great harvest of fish? The Bible said over 3,000 people came to know the Lord at one sermon, and the nets didn't break. They all came in to know the Lord. I believe this was a prophetic act, and Jesus is symbolizing that the disciples have entered into a new day. And church, I want to declare, this is a new day in the life of international church. We've entered into a new season. How Hallelujah. Things are not as they used to be. We are walking under a fresh anointing. There's a fresh endowment for service of power. If you'll just have faith and act on it, you hear me now, you're going to see miracles, signs, and wonders in your life. If you've been praying for somebody, if you've been wanting to see breakthrough, lift up your hand right now and say, oh God, I believe I'm in that new day. I'm in a new time. Hallelujah. Oh, the nets are not going to break. The power of God is going to come over you and you're going to be used of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now before when the nets broke, how many of you know it didn't matter to them, they left them there anyway. Why? Because before they realized that what they were doing fishing, their life was not fulfilling apart from Jesus Christ. And they realized that becoming a fisher of men and following the Messiah was better than catching even this great haul of fish. Do you understand that the haul of fish that they brought in in the first catch was probably more than they had caught all month or all year? They were leaving probably one of the biggest purses they left behind in order to follow Jesus Christ. But now they don't leave the nets. Now they don't leave the fish. Why? Because they've entered into a new day. Now they can enjoy the blessings of God. Now they can enjoy the favor of God in this season. I want to conclude this message by looking at, oh, that's just my notes on that. I forgot to hit the button. I got to preaching. forgot to hit the button. I want to conclude by looking at verse 12, and I want to try to bring something to light that I've already mentioned to you several weeks before. And that is, why does Jesus' followers post-resurrection have trouble recognizing him? Remember Mary? In the garden, she looks right in the face of Jesus and thinks he's the gardener. And she said, if you've moved him, let me know where you've moved him. How many of you remember that? And she didn't recognize it was Jesus until she heard his voice saying Mary, until he called her name. She needed to hear his voice to recognize him. Why was that? She's looking right in the face of Jesus. Why didn't she recognize him? Then we talked about on the road to Emmaus. They're talking with Jesus. He's sitting at the table right across from him. They don't recognize him until he lifts up the bread to bless him. How many of you remember that message? And they can see the scars in his wrist or they recognize that prayer sounds familiar. And they recognize it's Jesus. Why don't they recognize him? And then, of course, we have the disciples in the upper room. They're there hidden. Jesus comes in. They're scared to death. They think, they think they're seeing a ghost. And he has to invite them to touch his hands and his feet before they really recognize it's Jesus. And now we come to this story, and it says, yet none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? In other words, there was some degree of uncertainty that they couldn't tell just by looking at him, but they knew it had to be him. Why? Because he performed the miraculous catch of fish. Why is it that these people that knew Jesus, that walked with him for three and a half years, spent all kinds of time, why is it that they don't recognize him in the post-resurrected form? Now, I'm going to propose to you a possible solution. I may not be right. But I'm just going to try to connect some dots, and I'm just going to tell you, I I, I can't teach it as doctrine, but to me it makes sense. Now, to understand what I believe took place, why they didn't recognize it, we have to go back. Well, let me just show you. How many of you know if you saw a picture of this guy, and then you saw a picture of that guy, you might not know they were the same person? Huh? How many of you know that guy 
looks a good deal different than the second guy. Can you advance the slide for me, please? Something's happened here. Can you? No, going forward. Yeah. Now, when I had my beard, and I used to, ha- I had a beard for a number of years. When I shaved off my beard, we had a baby, a high chair. I don't remember how old the baby was, but it was old enough, it recognized me. And when I walked in and spoke to my own baby without a beard, the baby started crying. Pam had to tell, who was it, honey? Which one was it? Rachel? She was smarter than, no, I'm not going to say that. (laughs) Smarter than the average child. And so Rachel started crying. So Pam had to hug on me and love on me and say, it's daddy to convince Rachel that it was me. Why? Because there's a vast difference between somebody that has a beard and doesn't have a beard, right? You can't see the jawline. You can hide neck fat if you got that with a beard. A lot of things you can't see with a beard, okay? Now, as many, the Bible said, and I'm going to read out of the King James, Isaiah 52, 14 says, as many were astonished at thee, his visage or his appearance was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. That's the way the King James renders that verse of Scripture. Now, if you go back, and a lot of Greek scholars will tell you this. I'm not a Greek scholar, but I've just studied this and know that enough have said this. That is a little bit of a liberal interpretation. The, the, new, the King James translators wanted to make it palpable and acceptable for us when we read it. A more direct translation of the word for word in the, in the uh, Hebrew, I said Greek, but it was actually in Hebrew, it would read more like this. So marred from the form of man was his aspect that his appearance was not that of a son of man. In other words, what the prophet was saying was that his appearance was so affected and so distorted that he wasn't even recognized as a human being. Are you hearing me? Now, some of you have watched movies like The Passion and you've watched different movies but none of them have actually done total justice to what took place. Because Isaiah would say later on about his crucifixion, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was so brutalized that people could not even look upon him. They would turn, or, or, or they were repulsed. It would make them sick. And the scripture literally said that he w- didn't even look human. One of the reasons for that, we read in Isaiah 50 and verse 6, it says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that pulled off the hair. Now, I've watched several movies depicting the crucifixion of Jesus. I've never seen them where they've shown where they plucked out the hair of Jesus' face. Guys, if you've ever had a beard, you know that's very painful. When I have my beard, sometimes my, just my little baby would get their hand up in the beard and pull on it. Just a little baby. I'd go, oh, I'd move with the hand. Very painful. Your face is very sensitive. Patrick, you're smiling because you know what I'm talking about. Because he has a beard. When they pulled Jesus' beard out, he looked vastly different than he did with a beard. And plus, when you pull all that hair out like that, it would leave a scar. Now, we've already indicated that Jesus left those scars in his hands and in his feet and in his side. Why would he erase the scars from his face? Think about it. I believe that the reason that they didn't recognize Jesus was because he was beardless and his face bore those scars of the crucifixion. The Bible said in Revelation 5 and 6, John said, and I saw him that was in the midst of the throne as a lamb who had been slain. He kept those scars as symbols of his sacrifice for you and I. Those scars are his medals of honor. Those scars represent his victory and demonstrate his great love for us. Amen? 
In Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, the prophecy says, and they shall see him whom they pierced. And if you remember in the Hebrew, I told you, it's not translated in our Bibles, but in the Hebrew, when you go back to the original manuscripts, it says, and they will recognize him, and it has the two Greek letters, Aleph and Tau. They will recognize him, the Alpha and the Omega, whom they had pierced. How will they know that he's the one that's pierced if he doesn't bear the scars? I believe that the reason they didn't recognize Jesus in his resurrected form because he appeared as the lamb that had been slain for the sins of the world. Now, we have to remember that God is multidimensional. It doesn't mean that he has to stay in that form, but at least this is the way that John saw him in the book of Revelation. And it's probably the way the disciples saw him and they didn't recognize him. Would you stand to your feet, please? Musicians, would you come? There's a very popular story. Probably most of you have heard it, but I believe it is appropriate here. The story of a mother who was very disfigured. She had severe scars on her face and on her hands. That was the two primary places. There were some on her neck. And she had a daughter, and as that daughter grew up, she was always embarrassed by her mother's scars. You know how cruel children can be. And children would make fun of her mother, make fun of the scars on her face. And so the daughter was embarrassed by her mother. And you can imagine as she got to be a teenager, how many of you know teenagers are embarrassed by you even if you don't have scars? Right? But as she got to be a teenager, she distanced herself from her mother even more because she was embarrassed by the appearance of her mother with those severe scars on her face and on her hands. And then she came across a newspaper article and she found out why her mother was scarred. The article told a story of an apartment that had caught on fire. And it was a brutal fire. But this mother, in order to save her baby, soaked a blanket in water and went through the flames, wants to get the child, wrap the child up, and walk back through the flames again. And when she walked through the flames, her hands and her face were severely burned. And she bore the scars. And that daughter began to realize that those scars weren't ugly. But those scars represented the love that that mother had for her. My earnest prayer for myself and for every one of us is that when we look upon the scars of Jesus, we'll remember the great love that he had for us. The sacrifice that he made so that our sins could be forgiven. Not just so that we could go to heaven, but that we could have life abundantly and life eternal. Let us not ever be embarrassed to talk about the cross. Let us never be ashamed to sing about the blood of Jesus. For these are his medals of honor. And this is what bought our eternal salvation.